Well, I'm about to begin, um, and this is going to be more of a lecture than a hands-on demonstration because I can't bring a full-size tree here. And also, obviously, I'm shooting to put this on YouTube, so if you're in the witness protection program or camera shy, don't get in the way. <laughs> I've timed it to be about a 22-minute presentation. Uh, after I'm finished, I'll answer any questions anybody's got. Uh, my business cards here have um, our uh, links to our YouTube channel and our videos, which are on the Moringa. And we also have uh, samples of bread, Moringa seeds, and powder for sale up there. You can try this, the powder here. I have Moringa oil you can try to taste. If you have an empty container and you're thirsty, I've got Moringa tea here that, that's just, this is all free. Just take what you want. Uh, we have cookies up at, up at my booth also. Uh, I printed some basic information here, and if you want one, you're welcome to one of those. It's also scripted, as you can see. The reason is, at my age, if I don't script myself, I'm liable to lapse into an Abe Simpson onion story, and nobody <laughs> likes those very well. So. Uh, it'll start off a little bit slow, but there's a lot of information here, and please enjoy it but as I say I do apologize that I have to be scripted but if you hear me run on in a story like some of you already have you understand <laughs> so and somebody came along and took there they are now that ruins the suspense if I came out here today and tried to convince you that I held in the, in the palm of my hand one of the secrets to eliminating starvation in the world, reducing dependence on fossil fuels, and could cure over 400 medical problems, would you be skeptical? Of course, I was. But hopefully by the time I finish this little lecture, you'll well have convinced yourself that this tiny little seed can do that much and more. Now we're here at the Terlingua Green Scene and welcome to celebrate sustainable living. Living within the means that the land provides for ourselves without taking from the land more than it can provide. This is something today the world needs more than at any other time in our history. I'm 64 years old. I know I look 70, but I'm 64. Population of the world has exploded from two and a half billion in 1953 when I was born to 7.3 billion today, and it'll pass 10 billion by the time I die. That's one lifetime. One lifetime. Now, I plan on seeing my 100th birthday, but on my 100th birthday, there will be more people on the planet than. The increase will be more than the entire population of the world today. That is just amazing. And the amazing thing is every one of them wants to live like we live here in America. But the sure numbers isn't the full story. When I was in junior high school, my social studies teacher told us something we thought was inconceivable. He said that as the world's population increased and as technology advanced, the rest of the world would want to live the way we do here in America. Well, that was in 1965, and then there wasn't enough resources on the planet to support two and a half billion people living this way. The answer he suggested until the problem, unless the problem was addressed, would be that the world would grow more interconnected, and since there was a finite amount of resources, which is wealth, those at the top, us, would have to sacrifice lifestyle so those at the bottom could increase. And what's occurring now? Exactly that. It's not a global conspiracy. It's not caused by greedy corporations. It's not caused by politicians. That helps. But it's a result of communication, technological, and population growth. In simple terms, we're cutting the Earth's pie into smaller pieces. Man-made climate disruption, and all the rest that it's accompanying has made life more challenging, but far from impossible, and that's what festivals like this and presentations like mine are here to show you. Now we're here to show you the exciting rediscovery of an ancient plant that can bridge the nutrition and sustainability gap that we face as population rises and resources shrink. 
and how that ties into our true cause, sustainability. Honest, true sustainability. Now we live in one of the 32 or so counties in America where a sustainable life is possible without a lot of outside interference. Now many people think they're sustainable that are living here, but they're only a third to a halfway there. But even if half the people in the developed world did just that, got halfway to sustainability, the planet would be in far better shape. Of course, our goal, my wife and I, our goal personally is to be at 100% or as close as we can to that. Now we raise poultry for meat and eggs. That's our other passion besides this wonderful tree. And that's a different presentation, but still, even though we raise the chickens, we raise the eggs, we still have to drive to the feed store to get grains and feed. And if we don't hatch our own chicks, we still have to order chicks to be mailed to us. All this is taking resources. So we're not as sustainable as we thought. Flour, sugar, rice, coffee, toilet paper, we got to bring all that to us or we have to go to it. And at best, those of us out here have achieved 60% sustainability. But then one day, one of the half a million or so people that watched my um, YouTube videos on mixing poultry feed suggested Moringa. I'd never heard of it. Most people haven't heard of it. Now, over the next year, leading up to today, I've studied everything there is to study about Moringa. I planted a small test forest, then I expanded it now to 130 trees, and next year we're going to go to 1,000 trees here in the desert. What caused this change in my thinking was just a tiny little humble, nondescript little tree. It's almost an ugly weed. It's called the Moringa oleifera, or the drumstick, the ampala, the malungay, the horseradish, ben oil, latmak. They got a hundred names for it. This tree grows in areas that have the least water, that are the hardest to produce food in, and it thrives there. It grows and it blooms and fruits during the traditional dry season. And it famously saved one Indian farmer's cattle herd and his entire village from starvation. Just one little tree. And that village today in India celebrates this tree and promotes it worldwide and calls it the miracle tree, which is the most common name for it. Now I'll cover a few of the points about the Moringa tree, but I only have a short time, so I can't cover everything. This tree will thrive in zones nine and up. It does well in zone eight with care, and we're in zone 8B here, so it takes a little bit of care, but it will thrive and it will grow well. Barring a series of Siberian Express cold fronts that come through in a row, they'll, they'll they kill almost everything. We lost, if anyone was here six years ago, we lost all the eucalyptus trees to a, a Siberian Express. So it can be a little iffy here, but based on our experience, it doesn't matter because you can replant it every year. It'll regrow if it dies back anyway. It'll grow back from the trunk, and it'll grow up to 15 feet in one growing season, and at the end of the season, it'll produce flowers and seed pods so that if you need to replant, you can replant. We grew 14 trees is what we started with. That was my test forest. We planted them on May 2nd this year. They are 14 feet tall today. They're in full bloom. And before winter comes in, it'll provide us with several hundred seeds to continue to plant next year. That's half a growing season, essentially. And we went from zero to 15 feet. Meanwhile, for the last three and a half months, they've given us a leafy green vegetable for side dishes, soups, salads. Not just an oddity, like today. This is an oddity, and you can taste it. And that's fine. But we've been using it as part of our diet for three and a half months, planting it from a tiny little seed on May 2nd. That's, to me, that was the most amazing thing. After, after growing other things and seeing how other plants grow, the amazing thing to me was just how quickly these come up. They'll go from zero to this in about a month. And then all of a sudden it explodes and you can literally watch it go eight, nine, ten inches a day. Moringa is a perfect source of plant-based protein. It's about 30% protein. These leaves, which is what you eat, 
The leaves contain nine, all nine, amino acids that we require, the essential amino acids. Six of the seven essential minerals, 11 of 13 essential vitamins that we need. Gram for gram, or pound for pound, and this was the thing that really caught my eye when I was studying it. Gram for gram, pound for pound, it contains seven times the vitamin C of oranges, four times the vitamin A of carrots, four times the calcium of milk, three times the potassium of bananas, twice the protein of yogurt, 18 amino acids in total, 36 anti-inflammatories, yes, it's an arthritis treatment, 46 antioxidants, and 92 nutrients. There's a lot more as well, but there's also other wonderful benefits, and it's been an important part of Ayurvedic medicine for thousands of years. Here's some of the benefits that are not substantiated by the USDA, but are well known and documented. And again, another thing that just totally amazed me. Moringa balances blood sugar levels. It's a natural treatment and has been a natural treatment for thousands of years for diabetes and hypoglycemia. And it does not interfere with the diabetes medication. So if it were added to your diet and you're diabetic, It'll regulate your blood sugar, and it may reduce or eliminate the need, depending on what what, what stage of what diabetes you have. It may eliminate the need to have medication, but it also lowers blood pressure. I don't see any old guys here, but um, it's also a natural erectile dysfunction treatment, and it doesn't have the embarrassment of the four-hour embarrassment. <laughs> it's a natural headache treatment. It improves your digestion, it reduces feed cravings, and can actually stop binge eating. So you could add it to your diet if you're trying to lose weight. And it, it, it doesn't make you, it doesn't suppress your appetite. It reduces the cravings. Now that like Sounds like I said the same thing, but I didn't. It actually reduces the food cravings. So if you are if you just every day at 4 in the afternoon you go for a bag of potato chips, you'll find that as you reach for the bag of potato chips, you can think, I really shouldn't eat this. And then, of course, you say, I want it. And you'd say, well, yeah, I really shouldn't eat this. I won't. Also, immediately when you eat some, it's a non-narcotic mood enhancer. It actually makes you feel better, kind of levels you off. That's the key to Moringa that I noticed, is that it's a leveling food. We in America, we eat so many processed foods that we don't have a leveling effect. We have the highs and lows. A lot of that has to do with the, the killer, high fructose corn syrup. A lot has to do with that. But it's also the way we eat and the fact that there's so many processed foods. Just adding this kind of levels everything off. I, and, and I'm speaking from experience on these things. I'm not, this isn't something I got. If you go online, going off on a tangent, if you go online and you search, you search out the Moringa tree, you'll see a whole bunch of people like me standing there like this with these little tiny seedlings. Moringa's wonderful. How the hell do they know? They got a little tiny tree. They don't know. They're just parroting what they've seen and what they've read. And they mean well. They really do. But I've got 14-foot trees. I've got trees that have been feeding us. I, and I've been eating it regularly for about four months myself. And I can tell you it does all of those things. Unfortunately, I am an old guy, and that one problem I do have. Now, I'm also bald, so God wasn't good to me. But um, it, has, it has dealt with those problems. So I, it's just... The more I learn and the more I have it, the more amazing it is. In fact, Ayurvedic medicine lists about 400 things that Moringa can treat or cure, and that's just using it as a medicinal supplement, as a nutritional supplement. And this, for people like us here, this I thought was one of the most amazing things. And it actually, depending on your mood, if you've eaten some or not, it'll bring tears to your eyes. It's a nutritional supplement in uh, projects in the African Sahel region. Now, the Sahel is all that area where Somalia is and where, you, where the, of course, we, we know war is, is an issue that will bring malnutrition and starvation in any, any place. But in those areas where they just drought uh, and, and irregular rains have just been killing the people, they've used it as a nutritional supplement in, and they've done several projects. It has lowered the infant mortality rate. It has increased birth weights, so it gives children a better chance. 
it's reduced starvation among toddlers and it's increased and improved the quality of mother's milk. They use it in school-age children. They feed it in the schools now and it has eliminated hunger. It's allowed the kids to concentrate more on their school lessons and maybe they can grow up to solve some of our problems instead of being a problem. Now that's just nutrition for humans. Moringa's a graze for livestock also. I don't think it's suitable for um, horses, but um, ruminants and poultry, they thrive on it. And this is one of the key things that, um, that I found here for sustainability. It's been shown in Africa and Asia where that story of, um, of the Indian village has been repeated time after time when they feed their chickens and their livestock. When everything else has failed, they turn to Moringa where they should have gone there first and now they do go first. I've recommended uh, uh, to many people in, um, throughout Africa, I've had, I think I counted 16 countries where people have contacted me in Africa about poultry feed because that is another one of our passions. And I've got several videos about poultry nutrition. And I've suggested adding Moringa to their poultry diets. And some of the folks I've recommended it to, they're growing the uh, Moringa around their poultry houses for shade. They're also feeding the leaves to their flocks and then they're fertilizing the trees with the chicken manure, creating a circle of life. And it reduces the cost of the birds to the local villagers. So the moringa eaten as it's on its own helps, but also the moringa fed to the chickens, to the poultry, to the livestock. It helps by reducing the cost to the villagers. Now for those of us striving for sustainability, which is what this whole thing is about, Moringa can supplement and even replace the chicken feeds, the goat feeds, the sheep feeds that we have. On its own, it can totally replace it. Fed during the growing season as the green leaves that I've got here, it's all the animals require. Moringa grows on little water and it produces best during the hottest months of the year. You do have to give supplemental water to it. It does require some water, but my... Um, my forest of 130 trees goes through about 500 gallons of water a month, which if you figure it out is about a gallon to a gallon and a half of water per tree per week. So that's really not a whole lot of water once it's established. We water ours though with gray water. I've got a separate gray water system. We water it with gray water. We use a chicken and horse manure for um, fertilizer, coffee, coffee grounds. We even use um, diluted human urine for fertilizer, which is again a whole other presentation. But for use as a food product, it can be planted intensively. You can take up to nine trees per square foot and plant a plot. So now you're stretching your water even further. You're not getting wasted water. Nine per foot. When they get to be two to three feet in height, roughly, let's see, right about there from the ground. This isn't, this is ground level here, but from the ground up to about two to three feet in height, you cut them off down to 18 inches, strip the leaves or hang them to dry. When they're dried, the whole thing, stems and all, can be mixed with your chicken feed, your goat feed, your, your sheep feed. No, no, I'm not making a flower for myself. You can do that. <laughs> and, um, or you can take it and you can strip them out and you can dry the leaves and make moringa powder, which I've got here. If anyone wants to just taste moringa powder, pour a little in the palm of your hand and then lick it off, pass that around. And the same thing with the oil. I've got moringa oil here, which I'll get into in just a minute, but take a little, put it in the palm of your hand and taste it. What you do though, you dry the leaves, crush them, put them in a spice mill, grind them up till you've got a powder, then sieve it, do it two or three times, and that powder will last you throughout the entire winter as a green vegetable until your plants start uh, producing again. It's highly concentrated when you get it in powder form, so you only really need a teaspoon to a tablespoon a day to provide all the nutrients. And I don't use the recommended daily allowance or anything like that because we don't want anybody to think of this as a, uh, as a fad food, as, as um, a supplement or a health food. We want you to think of it as a vegetable. 
So the powder is highly concentrated. You can take it in a warm tea drink or a cold tea drink, which you're very welcome to try my uh, Moringa tea. You can put it in a smoothie or you can take it dry. You can actually, what I do in the morning is I take a, a tablespoon of that dry in the morning, just throw it in my mouth and drink it with a glass of water. It tastes that good that it's not off-putting like spirulina would be. If you add the powder to soups and gravies, that powder will thicken and enhance the flavor much the same way as monosodium glutamate does, but it doesn't have any of the negative aspects of MSG. Thanks. I bake bread to sample also. I've got lots of bread and Debbie has cookies up there at the um, at our booth. Sorry, I'm cutting it short because I don't want to get too long. <laughs> the powder can be added to any baking. Uh, sweet or savory and the funny thing was that I went through a thousand recipes and I'm serious I actually went through 1,000 recipes online trying to find a recipe to make sweets And I couldn't find anybody that had ever used it in baking So I had to start myself to develop recipes and I have a wonderful recipe for coffee cake morning coffee cake Using moringa and cinnamon. That's amazing. It is green But I mean we'd eat green eggs and ham. So why not? Um, and I, uh, I also came up with my cookie recipe, which is a really nice sugar cookie. And if you haven't tried it, please, Debbie's got them up there. If you add it to these breads, the interesting thing is bread is already called the staff of life. and You can virtually live on bread alone. Add moringa to it and you are just, you're increasing the nutritional value of it. Now the unfortunate thing about moringa, and I have to tell you this so that you know it, it's found its way into the group of foods called superfoods, and it is a superfood. But when I use the term superfoods, what's the first thing you all thought about? Acacia berry or acacia berry, excuse me. Acacia berry, goji berry, seaweed, chia seed, amaranth, spirulina. All these things that are heavily promoted. They're here today, they're heavily promoted, they're high cost, and then they disappear when somebody comes along and says, Oh, look at I have found um, cactus root which is sad and because they've gone into that you can buy moringa powder commercially it's from fifteen dollars to forty dollars a pound and that the, the, the reason you can grow it's the that easily right three to five bushes just outside your door exactly and then you want to come and read the script because that was the next paragraph <laughs> Succinct, short delivery. But see, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm known for going around Sorry, the bush, telling. you know. And I should, I'm trying to cut it short, that's why I keep looking down at this. Here, all right, here, here's your bottom line. Save that one in the cut, though. Here's your bottom line. I'm not going to cut any of this. I mean, okay. I don't cut my stuff. I hush. Your turn. No, no. Here's the thing, though. You have no way of knowing when you're buying a Moringa powder or any of these health foods. If they're not regulated, you have no idea of the quality. Moringa deteriorates. When you try to dry it in the sun, it deteriorates. When you use heat, it deteriorates. So the $15 a pound stuff has probably been sun dried or heat dried. Increases the profit margin. And here's a big, here's a, here's somewhere in here. There we go. If you're paying $30 a pound for Moringa or Amaranth or Spirulina or any superfood or any fad food, if you're paying $30 a pound for it and you think it's worth it, but you get into money trouble, what's the first thing you're going to cut from your diet? You're going to cut the $30 a pound Moringa. So now you're not getting the health benefits. And I always like to, and, and you can have, you can have, you can laugh at me for this. I always point at myself to people. When I was 17 years old, I started out studying nutrition and eating correctly. Now I love to eat, so I'm always a little extra, a little overweight. But I started studying nutrition. My father died at 50. His brother died at 55. Everyone in my family that has died, with the exception of a couple of ne a niece and a nephew that died in car accidents, everyone in my family that has died has died from hypertension-related heart disease. I do not have good genetics. But does anybody want to race me? Does anybody want to try to work side by side with me? That's not good genetics, but it is good nutrition. So if you're going to cut out the $30 a pound Moringa because it's $30 a pound, you're not doing yourself any good. So what do we do? Well, what about growing our own? If you grow your own, 
Now you're not paying $30 a pound. You walk out to the backyard, you strip off a few leaves, you throw that in your soup, you put it in your salads. These leaves, this is what you strip off here. They'll grow in a full-size tree. They'll be about like that with a spread like that. You break this off, you just run your fingers down here. I don't want to strip this tree. But all the leaves pop right off. Throw it in your soups. I, it's, I can tell you for absolutely is excellent in soup and in spaghetti sauce, of all things. It really makes the spaghetti sauce good, as well as bacon. And I think that's one of the biggest points I wanted to make. I'm trying to cut all this down. Sustainability. Since it's not been modified, it's not, it's not a seed that, that you have to buy seeds when you replant it. You can actually grow your own seeds, replant them. You can also take, you have to have a mature tree, which a mature tree is like mine, even though they're six months old, they qualify as a mature tree. Cut off a section of the trunk or a branch that's grown out, root was, the cutting. Yeah, that was my question. Root the cutting yeah. and you've got a clone. Exactly. That you have a clone, and you can root the cuttings, and you have a big head start if you root the cuttings. But you only have about a, you've got about a three-week head start, is what I noticed, because I've actually done it. Um, Are they deciduous? Deciduous as in? Well, like when winter comes, do they freeze? Do they do they drop their leaves? And then See, I'm not, I'm, I'm self-educated, so some things... <clears throat> They do drop their leaves. They'll go dormant. Okay. I think I, I might have had that in here. They will go dormant. If the temperature goes below 40 degrees, they will go dormant. You start having 40 degree nights. If you if you allow the soil to freeze, you will lose the plant. In, well, you just mulch it. You just mulch it. Around here, I've mulched stuff for, for years. Uh, Debbie and I, which is part of my introduction that I didn't do. Debbie and I have lived here for, uh, this is, uh, we're just shy of seven years now. You mulch stuff. It works fine. I mean, I I had plants that lived through that freeze six years ago, where other people lost all their plants. I didn't lose them by because of mulching. So I mean, we're we're like on the edge. We're just it's like just move that zone a little. Just give us a quarter degree more of of, uh, of global warming, and we're we're in zone nine. So we're that close. So they grow okay at this altitude, but I'm wondering about higher altitude. You know what? I'm going to skip the rest of it. I have told you just about everything here, except uh, uh, our altitude here. Well, you're at 2,000 or 2,500 feet here. I'm at 30, 30, uh, 300 feet at my place. They grow fine here. Although some of the literature you'll see will say that it doesn't grow real well at altitudes. It does. It comes from the, from the foothills of the Himalayas. I mean. The thing is, you, what, what people write books. We, I, I said this earlier, and this is a line I, I love to add to this. Europeans and Westerners, we love to take the simplest thing and complicate the shit out of it, complicate the hell out of it, to make it um, simple. Well, the problem is, when you start complicating how to raise chickens, how to raise goats, how to raise horses, how to raise plants, how to plant a garden, it's great. But the tree doesn't read the book. The tree only knows what got it here. This is an ancient plant. It has actually, there have been references to it going back 7,000 years. This tree has been around for a very long time. And literally, the seeds, and I used this earlier, the seeds fall off of the tree onto the ground, animal steps on it, and that's what germinates it. <laughs> That's what germinates. I had I have seen 15-minute videos from people that are taking and peeling these wings off the tree. They'll peel the wings off of it. They'll peel the kernel. Let me show my camera the kernel, which I've just crushed when I stepped on it. That's the kernel that's inside. Now, I've, I've crushed it, but that's what the kernel looks like. And if any one of you is extremely brave and wants to taste it, you're welcome to pick it up and taste it. It will not hurt you. But you'll wish it would. <laughs> it is bitter. First, it hits you with. Yeah, don't. Well, I, I warned you. It first hits you with a burst of sugar, and then it goes bitter on you. I don't no, it like it. Like a, it's a nut. It tastes like a bitter nut. Does it? He does it. To me. Okay. See, I don't like it. Good. I don't raw. But you can pop it like popcorn. Huh. It works like. Well, you can also. Not part of the presentation, but you can also pop Milo, sorghum, like popcorn, and it's healthier for you than popcorn. Um, 
I just, I want to look, oh, okay, the last thing that I wanted to bring out, I, I script about half of this because, unfortunately, YouTube people, you have to, you have to play to the audience. Um, one other thing that I think is very important, because I want to hit real hard because we're here talking about sustainability. You plant it, it'll, it'll provide you all the seeds you want. To, so you can replant and continue to plant. It'll feed you for as long as it stays alive. If you do it in monoculture, like I said, nine plants per square foot, cutting it down to 18 inches, this is the beauty of it. If you're trying to grow wheat, you grow up your wheat, you harvest it, you got to till the soil all up, you're disturbing the nematodes, you're disturbing all the soil bacteria and loosening up the soil. And then you replant your wheat. You got to go to the store, get the seeds. They got to be treated with insecticide. Blah, all those things that take—they take what? They take fossil um, fertilizers and fossil-based insecticides. Once this plant is planted, grows up, cut it down. Come back in six weeks, cut it down. Come back in six weeks, cut it down. We can get here. We can get five crops a year. If I planted an area this size, I could get five crops a year and I could feed all of us with it. That's amazing. That's utterly amazing. One more thing. The seeds, I, I wish I, I didn't have any seed pods yet because they've just started blooming. But the blooms in the seed pods are edible. The blooms taste very much like the seed, uh, like the leaves, but they're sweet, very sweet. The pods, when they're about that long to about there, you can harvest them, cut them. Um, they, they'll cut them up like okra, but they don't taste or cook like slimy okra does. They'll have a very mild asparagus flavor to them. So that's another thing you can eat. But if you allow them to go to seed, like my blowing away seeds here did, these seeds are 40% oil. 40% oil. So you can crush it. You crush the oil out of the seeds, you're left with a seed cake, a, cr a pressed seed cake. And if you've ever crushed anything or pressed, you know, um, uh, for wine, you know, done grapes for wine or anything, you know you're left with that pulpy base. Twelve countries, there are, there are uh, mainly European countries, but twelve countries are now using the, the seed cake to purify water with, and it purifies water better than using aluminum as a base with no potential health problems from the aluminum. And then the seed cake can be fed to livestock and it's still got protein in it. The oil. Now the oil is, um, some of you tasted it, it's an excellent topical, it's analgesic and antibacterial. So you can use, it's also used in cosmetics, so it's very good for your skin. I've used it, uh, my dogs are hairless dogs, which is a whole other story. They're prone to skin cancer, and I have some that have some precancerous tumors, um, uh, lesions, I should say. They will heal those lesions. They don't do away with them, but they're stemming off the inevitable on these dogs. It also is lighter. It's a very light oil for cooking. It has a very high smoking temperature. It does have a colder clouding temperature. I mean, a higher clouding temperature. So it will cloud at, at I, I, I'm picking a number here, but let's say that vegetable oil will cloud at 35 degrees. This will cloud at 40. But who knows what the original diesel engine was designed to run off of? Who, who can tell me what the... Or the vegetable oil. Peanut oil. Yeah, peanut oil. Peanut oil. Yeah. The original diesel engine was designed to run on peanut oil. I've done it. And we this has, that. it's lighter, it's thinner, <laughs> it has more BTUs per ounce than peanut oil, and it burns without residue. This is a substitute, as is, for diesel fuel, and then the caveat there is, of course, at a temperature like this. Or as a base for bio for biodiesel. Can you imagine the ramifications of growing this in areas that nothing really grows? You're freeing up croplands and creating a food source number one, a water purification source number two, and a source of fuel where we're using carbon that was sequestered this year instead of carbon that was sequestered 65 million years ago. Absolutely one of the most amazing plants I've ever seen. I'm going to get back to my script here. This plant 
all of the world's problems can be solved. That's this is my big finish. Everybody's got listen to my big finish. <laughs> all of the world's problems can be solved if we all, if each of us, each one of us, there's 7.2 billion of us, if each person picked just one thing to be passionate about. One thing. It could be chia seeds. It could be dogs. It, whatever that one, it could be tie-dyeing clothing. If we picked one thing, each of the world, all of the world's problems can be solved. And I really hope that you've enjoyed hearing about my one passion that we picked. That's it. That's all I got, guys. Thank you for sticking it out. <laughs> Mm, wow. you have a card? Do you? Oh, any questions, too. Questions. I'll answer yeah. anything. I do have a card. You have yeah. seeds for sale. Yeah, he does. Uh, yeah. Please, please. please. The third boot. Yeah. The third. Yeah. <coughs> Let's go check out their ether. Yeah. yeah. His wife is running. Oh, yeah. I'll get his name. You should come to my place and actually see what they've done in one season. If it's that's what you're, if you're thinking of that. Well, we're looking for good things. We should see the lamp on Trader Bombs. It's everywhere. Yeah. 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 The mailbox is our for Trilingo <laughs> Ranch. I'm five miles west. There. Five miles west. <laughs> I was. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was me. Yeah. 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 Good speaker. Yeah. Yeah. I figure we, if we yes. start with comfort, your, 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 your health is a lot better. We're going to get you. Well, the health is better because working out, I work outdoors all day. Yeah, and that's good. I, 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 I've been a truck driver. But I work outdoors all day building this house. I can't work with the bottles. I was almost killed in a, in a mining accident. Yeah, I remember you told me. And so what, I, 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 what I'm doing is I'm building with bottles, empty bottles. And I've collected over 80,000 bottles, and I've used about 35,000 in my house. Why don't you go see your wife? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> and um, Thank you. Oh, thank you for sticking it out. Oh, I have to have somebody to play off of or I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs>